Well, take your Bibles and open up with me to John chapter 16. John chapter 16 is where we are. And today's lesson is entitled, Heaven's Peace in a World of Anxiety, okay? And uh, before we look at the text, just let me walk you through this idea biblically. Jesus' disciples all of a sudden are hearing him talk about dying, they're listening to that, they're clearly saying, hey, he's talked like this before, but now he's more frequently talking about it. And they find themselves engaged in hearing him saying, I'm going to my father. They know the father isn't coming down, so they know that means he's leaving. And suddenly they find in all of that discussion that he's going to tell them they're going to be alone for a little bit. And you can imagine, well, I'll just use, uh, I'll just use the writer's words for it. He says, Christians do not run from the hostile world. They are God's witnesses to the world. But that means that they do not quite fit the world just as Jesus did not quite fit the world. So the world treats them as it treated Jesus. And when Jesus announced his departure, the anxiety level of the disciples became intense. There is a reason that the disciples are hiding after the crucifixion of Christ because they think they're, it's batter up and they're the next one. Okay? So here's your picture. The disciples have every cause to be anxious. And look with me at John 16, just the final verse, there in verse 33. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Okay. So that's the disciples' version of anxiety. Let me tell you your version and my version. One of the greatest struggles that young people have today is an increased difficulty with anxiety. And if you think about that for very long, parents, you're going to recognize the reason for that. I spent my entire life growing up. I grew up like in Midwestern Indiana. If I wanted to go play basketball over at the high school, I was like 11 years old. I'd get on my bike. I'd ride over there. It was a mile and a half away. I never even thought about it. Right? The school doors were wide open. The the only danger we had in my entire time of growing up was a potential flooding issue in, uh, in Indiana when the rain was coming down. It was like, it was like that's it, okay? I can't fathom what it's like to live in the generation that our kids are growing up in. That's why over half of young people struggle with anxiety in some way, shape, or form. By the way, adults, we're not much better. About a third of us do. So just think about that for a second. One, two, three. Wherever you're sitting, it's either you or the person to the left or the person to your right. Okay. And if you think about it very long, you're going to realize that we all struggle with anxiety. This passage helps tremendously because here, with Jesus just hours away from the cross, he shows concern for the disciples. In fact, note the text, here it is in verse 16. He says there, a little while and you will see me no longer, that should cause them to be anxious, and again a little while and you will see me, that should cause them to be confused, and they are, look, verse 17. So some of his disciples said to one another, what is this that he says to us? A little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me, because I am going to the Father, is that why he's saying it, they're saying? So they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. And Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, is this what you are asking yourselves, what I meant by saying a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned to joy. Okay? So there's a couple thoughts that go with that idea. You can face uncertain future, you can face an uncertain future with the hope of eternal life. Okay? You can face an uncertain future with the hope of eternal life. In fact, Jesus makes mention of that in the first part of that verse. He says, in a little while and you won't see me, but in a little while longer and you will see me. There's a number of ways you can interpret that, but I, I think probably the clearest interpretation of that has to do with the fact that he is about to be crucified and then they think he's gone forever and then three days and he's back again. Okay? A little while, a little while. In a little while, he says, you won't see me because I'll be in the tomb. But in a little while longer, you will see me again. And I was thinking about that, just this idea that, that we can find hope, Jesus is saying, by remembering that life in Christ is eternal. 
It's eternal. In fact, whatever we're anxious about today, this life just does not end someday. We find our confidence in Christ. And I think Christ is referencing here this idea that I will be back again, and then he'll say a little later, then I'm going to go to my Father, but then I'm coming back again. In other words, this life is that we can have in Christ is an eternal life. Now, let me give you a couple ideas. The hope of eternal life, here they are. Pain in this world cannot be avoided, but it can be transformed. Okay? Pain in this world cannot be avoided, but it can be transformed. <laughs> in fact, you find that in verse... Uh, in verse, 19, in, in verse uh, 20, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. Now watch what happens. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. Meaning, they were deeply sorrowful because everything they planned, everything they taught, everything they were thinking was going to happen. Christ was going to rule. They were going to rule with him. All of that just disappears at the cross. But three days later, in their sorrowing, they suddenly find that they are joyful. Here's the picture. God has this incredible way of transforming our difficulty and our pain. I was talking with my class earlier this morning about this idea that uh, when someone asks you the question, like, I believe in God, but why do bad things happen? Bad things happen, but God, only God, can transform those bad things. In fact, um, when, uh, when our first child was born, I remember uh, Kim had said to me, listen, um, when, when, when we go to the hospital, um, I don't want an epidural, okay? I'd like to do this without an epidural. I said, okay. She said, promise me, promise me that whatever happens, whatever I say, whatever I do, you're not gonna let me get an epidural. I said, okay, okay, I promise you, right? We got to the parking lot, the hospital. She stopped. She, she was having a contraction. She stopped. She said, I think I'm going to need an epidural. I said, okay, we'll do whatever we can do. Okay. Okay. I, I looked at that pain and I said, I will never experience that pain and I don't want to, but I'm going to do everything I can to help that pain go away. Here's the thing. You know what helps the pain go away? The baby's cry. Because okay. the moment the baby cried, there were smiles, there were tears, there were... It's like, and that's exactly what Jesus says. Watch this. When a woman is giving birth, verse 21, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. It's like Jesus says, listen, God can take pain and transform it. I was thinking about that verse. Like, I was thinking, wow, like that really seems out of context to me. Like one moment Jesus is talking about dying, and the very next moment he's saying, oh, by the way, right, uh, when a woman has labor pains, but then I started thinking about that all the more. His very death and pain brings about new life and new birth. Right? There's a reason Jesus said in John chapter 3, unless you are born from above or unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. The, the very death of Christ, all of that anguish and all of that pain brings about this, the remarkable picture and the remarkable reality that you and I, having placed our faith in Christ, are born anew. We're born again. It's like the old is gone and the new has come. All of that's possible. Because of the pain and anguish Jesus goes through. And by the way, push pause here for a second and realize when we come to Easter and Good Friday in just a few weeks, when we come there, sometimes we've been remiss to think that, that the cross is like, it's the cross that he's afraid of, the pain he's afraid of. Jesus is not afraid of the pain. Jesus fears, and the text uses that, the idea of terror in, uh, in, in John chapter 12. The text uses the idea that he is terrified by this, that having had a perfect relationship with his father through all of eternity past, that relationship is about to be torn in some way. In fact, if you pictured this image that, that on the cross, the father turns his back on Jesus... I would tell you that it's far more proactive than that. On the cross, the Father looks with righteousness and pours his wrath on Jesus so that your sins and my sins can be paid for. 
Jesus looks and understands all of that anguish and probably just brings this idea out that, listen, even in anguish, there is a new birth and there is joy. Even the disciples would come to understand that. Pain in this world cannot be avoided, but it can be transformed. Okay? God can transform it. Here's your second idea. Oh, in fact, let me just cra- capture M.S. Mills's words on this. This, then, is the resource, resource with which to face persecution. For saints have Christ's resurrection as proof that we, too, have an immortal, eternal existence after death. All sorrow will be turned to joy in this state. For in death we are born into eternity. This joy is an enduring feature of, Christians, of a Christian's life. We have a wonderful resource with which to face persecution and even death. What? The resurrection of Christ. This is beautiful. It is why the Christian funeral is different. It's different. It's got to be different than all other religions trying to have a funeral. There would have to be, for the person who is truly a believer, some element of celebration in it, even though there is a loss for us. Because the reality and truth is that they have gone and live in a far better place. Remember that quote that Billy Graham used to share, the idea that, listen, someday you'll hear that I have died. Don't believe a minute of it. I have only changed addresses. Wow. I was uh, this weekend with a friend of mine. His father was a pastor in Maine, and uh, a few years ago, his father was preaching at that church in Maine, and this was his final message. He said, I am so certain of heaven. I am certain, so certain, that it is as if I have already been there and seen it, right? and I've come back. And that afternoon, he went home, had lunch, and went to heaven. Right? There is, for the Christian this unbelievable reality that because Christ said, in a little while you won't see me, but then in a little while I'll be resurrected and you'll see me again, there is for the Christian this unbelievable truth that the resurrection changes the way we look at death. Now, by the way, in our world and in our generation, you might hear something like, well, that's good. Everybody's going to heaven. That's not what the Bible teaches. Jesus said just a few chapters earlier in John 14, I am the way, not I am a way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus' presentation has a degree of exclusivity to it. It it, it isn't open to, it is open to everyone to believe, but it isn't open to everyone if they don't believe, right? Here's your picture. The resurrected life of Christ is available to those who have believed. In fact, John's going to tell you that over a little later in John 16, where Jesus actually says that uh, the disciples have believed in him. Here's your next idea. Pain in this world is a reality, but this world is not all there is. Okay? Pain in this world is a reality, but this world is not all there is. In fact, look at verse 33. We started with that verse. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation. That is, in this world you have persecution and difficulty. But take heart, I have overcome the world. And Matthew 6, 33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all these things will be added unto you. In other words, our focus is to remember that this world is not all there is. In fact, um, Anytime I'm away uh, doing ministry, I'm good for about five or six days, and then I have to come home, right? Because my family's here. And so I go, and I get over there, and then I just want to be home. I'm tired of texting. I want to see them. I can remember when we were in Bosnia, and we served there for two weeks. By the time I got to the fifth day, I was like, uh, I I was homesick. I'll just tell you that, okay? I mean, I love the Bosnian people. I love what we were doing, but I just wanted to get home. I never once thought that Bosnia was my home. I enjoyed the Bosnian people. I enjoyed talking to them. I enjoyed hearing through a translator their stories. I enjoyed serving them. We delivered goods to a hospital. We gave mattresses to widows who were sleeping on concrete floors. It it was remarkable, but uh, when the container was empty, I didn't call Kim and say, hey, I think I'm going to stay over here for a while because that wasn't home. What if we thought of this world as the far country 
and thought of heaven as home. But see, we reverse that. We think of heaven as the far off place and this place is home. Pain in this world is a reality, but this world is not all there is. Jesus makes it clear, listen, take heart. I've overcome the challenges of this world. There's a hope of eternal life. Here's the final idea. Pain in this world is better understood after we pass through it. Pain in this world is better understood after we pass through it. This whole first part of verses 16 down through about verse 21 seemed confusing to the disciples. I'll be honest with, me, with you. It seems a little confusing to me, okay? In a little while, then I'm going to do this, and in a little while, then I'll do that. And then Jesus says to the disciples, listen, did you not understand what I meant by a little while? Yes, we didn't understand. I thought that. So then Jesus tries to explain that to them. But I was trying to think about this. Can you think of a better option? Okay. He is about to tell them, um, I'm going to die in about 12 hours. And when that's over, I'm going to be buried for about three days, and then I'm going to come back. Would you believe that? Like, like, like if you went to the hospital and saw uh, someone you really cared for, and they were in their final moments, and they said, hey, they wanted to talk to you right before they go, and they say, listen, don't worry, I'll be back in three days. Okay. You'd say, uh, I don't think so. Right? The truth of the matter was this, that they could not have understood what was coming. And so Jesus hides it from them in a sense by saying, listen, in a little while, I'll be gone. In a little while, I'll be back. Jesus understands that sometimes when you face that degree of pain and suffering, the the pain in this world is better understood, frankly, after we pass through it. It's better understood that way. In fact, um, MacArthur's study Bible captures it this way. What seemed hard to understand to the disciples during the life of Jesus would become clear after his death resurrection, and the coming of the Holy Spirit. They would actually understand the ministry of Christ better than they had while they were with him as the Spirit inspired them to write the gospels and epistles and minister in and through them. Can you imagine when they're writing down the stuff, they're saying, oh, I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it. You and I weren't there. We have the epistles to read. We have the rest of the gospels to read. They didn't. They were experiencing the pain. Stop, listen. In the middle of your pain, you may not be able to grasp all the purposes of it. That's okay. That doesn't make you less spiritual. It simply means this, that you need to trust God through it because it will become more clear on the other side of that. In fact, the reference I have here for you is Luke 24. Go go over there with me if you would. Luke chapter 24. Luke 24. Jesus, you may remember, is walking with uh, these two individuals on the road to Emmaus. They're away from Jerusalem, and they were talking to each other. You see this up in verse 13. Verse 14, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near uh, and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Okay, I love this. It's like, it's like they don't know who they're talking to. And he goes along with them, and he says to them, listen, what's happening? And they start to tell him, how do you, how can you even be in Jerusalem and not know what's happened, right? And then they go on to say, listen, this Christ, this Savior, the one we thought would be the Messiah, he's been crucified. He's no longer dead. And now his, some, some of the women from his following, the group, came and said to us, he's alive, and, and, and we're, we can't understand any of this, right? But look at verse 27. And beginning with Moses... That's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and all the prophets. Those are the 17 prophets in the Bible. He interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. They still don't recognize him. This is amazing. They don't know who it is, but it's starting to make sense to them. And you know that because by the time you get to verse 32, look at what we read. And they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? In fact, in verse 30, when he was at a table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them, and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. Rembrandt was caught up with this image. I remember when uh, he had a show over at the museum, the art gallery in Philadelphia. My daughter and I went over there to see it, and it, it was the faces of Jesus was the, was, um, was the show. But in particular, when you got back to the back part of that gallery, um, there was this really remarkable expression 
of Rembrandt trying to figure out how to draw this up. And so all he had was pencil sketches of a man breaking bread and this look of expression on these guys' eyes, almost comic-like, like they knew who he was all of a sudden. And then in the next sketch, they were there and the bread was there, but the chair was empty. Right? Okay, just picture, that's what it would have been like. But for them, they understood something now that they hadn't understood before because they could see their pain and suffering and difficulty and they understood it after they had passed through it. Hmm. I asked this question in my class earlier this morning. Just let me ask you. How many of you have known some degree of pain in your life that caused you to grow more in your relationship with the Lord? Can I see your hands? Yeah, there it is. This is the great secret of a pastor that they never taught me in seminary, that everyone who is going through some level of difficulty Often a believer, when they lean into the Lord, grow like crazy in that moment of difficulty. Okay? They probably didn't teach us that in seminary because that's not really probably a great way to grow a church. Like, come to our church, go through suffering and pain, and you'll grow. Okay? But I'm telling you right now, it's when we're walking through that pain and we get on the backside of it and we look back that we can raise our hands and say, that's where I grew. Here's the image I want you to see. Jesus understands that they don't fully understand and they won't fully understand. There's hope of eternal life. He's going to be resurrected and he tells them that in advance. Here's the second idea. You can be assured that God hears your prayers and answers as his best. Okay? You can be assured that God hears your prayers and answers as his best. Go back with me to John chapter 16. Here we're reading <clears throat> again. Jesus says, in that day, you will ask nothing of me. Truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Now, let's just talk about that for a second. Jesus must be referring to in that day, a, a, a day that is following the resurrection. You may remember the, the Bible makes clear that he was on the earth for 40 days after his resurrection, and then he went to heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father. So here's the picture. He's not there to ask, okay? But the Spirit, the Holy Spirit will come. That's what John 15 taught us. The Holy Spirit will come. And so Jesus says, listen, in my name you may ask. You can be assured that God hears your prayers and answers as his best. I'll give you a couple thoughts that go with that. We ought to ask in a way that is consistent with the character of Christ. We ought to ask if we're going to ask in his name that is consistent with the character of Christ. Let's imagine momentarily uh, that uh, Pastor Scott and Justin decide they want a new car. Okay. So they, uh, they go out together on a Friday night late, and they, uh, um, they take a clothes hanger, and they get inside a car, and they pop the car, and then because Scott knew about this in his past life, he hot-wired the car. Okay. I'm just making that part up, all right? I don't want to start any rumors, okay? They hotwire the car. When they get pulled over, here's what they say. The policeman pulls them over and says, this looks like a stolen vehicle. They say, hey, but you know that pastor over at Fellowship Bible Church, the other pastor, Pastor Phil, okay, he told us we should do it. Okay. Suddenly, I'm pulled into the situation, right? Now, I've never stolen a car, okay? N neither of these guys, by the way, but just imagine momentarily. They are using my name to to demonstrate what they're trying to do. Are you with me? That's what we sometimes do with Christ. When we say in Jesus' name, that request should be consistent with the character of Christ, not something otherwise. In fact, the SV Study Bible captures it this way. Praying in Jesus' name means praying in a way consistent with his character and his will. A person's name in the ancient world represented what the person was like. It also means coming to God in the authority of Jesus Probably both senses are intended here. Effective prayer must ask for and desire what Jesus delights in. So don't say, God never answers my prayer, right? And I always say it in Jesus' name. Maybe you should consider if your prayer is in conjunction with the character of Jesus' name. Here's your second idea. We ought to ask with confidence that God hears and answers. We ought to ask with confidence that God hears and answers. Hey, here's a great question. Have you ever been surprised by God's answer? Like, like you just said, um, wow, that just happened, right? I had an occasion just, uh, just this past weekend for that. Kim and I were away at a conference in, um, 
and I had a few minutes and I needed a file. Okay, now, if you've ever, I don't know what your computer is like, but here's what mine is. I save everything to my desktop, just everything. Everything's on my desktop until my desktop gets full and then I throw it all in a file, okay? And I just put it in somewhere else. And then I save everything to my desktop until I throw it to a file. So I'm in need of a file and I can't find the file, right? And um, I thought to myself and I said, Lord, I got five minutes, like, and I'm looking at all of these files, and they all have numbers on them. They don't have anything on that I, because I didn't label them properly, right? There's a whole slew of files, and I said, Lord, I need this one picture. I just need one picture, and I don't really have time. Uh, please, grant me grace. Amen. Okay. I clicked on a file, and there was the first picture. Okay. And I remember saying, uh, are you here? Like, did, did you hear that, right? Like, did that really happen? See? God answers those prayers in such a way that we can have confidence that he hears and answers. Sometimes those answers aren't in the way that we necessarily appreciate them. I remember hearing and reading the story of Corey Ten Boom. Corey Ten Boom and her family were from Holland initially, but during the Nazi regime, they were hiding Jewish people in in their home in Holland. They had a secret hiding room where they would hide them there. One day the Germans found out about it and they came and took not only the Jewish people to the concentration camp, but they took Corrie ten Boom and her family to the concentration camp. Kim and I have visited that um, concentration camp in Ravensburg Prison in Germany. It's like, uh, it, it, it feels like it's just impossible to describe the feeling that you have there. You were standing there realizing that almost every person who lived in one of those barracks died and was executed. Corey Ten Boom told the story, Ravensbrück was a women's prison, and she told the story that when she and her sister would hold Bible studies with the other women that were in that barrack, that they, uh, that they had a problem in the barracks because they weren't showering in the barracks and the flea problem was significant. And she used to pray over and over again that the flea, God would take away the fleas and God never took away the fleas. And her sister said, Betsy said to her, Corey, you should start being thankful for the fleas. She said, how can you be thankful for fleas? Until years later, they found out that because the fleas were there, the German guards didn't come into their barracks to harass them. Sometimes the ways we're praying aren't necessarily answered in a way we would expect. In God's sovereignty, they are. So what happened was the women in their barracks hadn't been abused like the other women had been, and just as importantly, the women in their barracks were able to engage in the Bible study without ever being interrupted by the German guard, only the fleas. We had asked with confidence that God hears and answers. He may answer us in a way that causes us to say, whoa, God is here, or he may answer us in a way that may cause us later to say, God's answer was better than mine could have ever been. In fact, that brings us to the last idea. We ought to ask with a spirit of submission to the greater wisdom of God. We ought to ask with a spirit of wisdom, submission to the greater wisdom of God. My favorite place in the scripture to prove this from is Mark fourteen thirty six. If you've ever thought about the character of God, just for a moment, think about this. I like to imagine that the character of God is formed like a triangle. On one side, I write the love of God. On the other side, I write the power of God. On the bottom, I write the wisdom of God. It's a triangle. The love of God, the power of God, the wisdom of God. I am in that triangle. When I grow anxious, I kick out a wall of that triangle. I start to wonder, does God really love me? Why is he letting me go through this? I maybe kick out another wall of that triangle, and I think to myself, hmm, Maybe God isn't powerful enough to do something now. Or I kick out another wall of that triangle, and the triangle might sound like this. Like, maybe God doesn't really know what I need as well as I know what I need. Here's a great thought for you. We ought to ask in our prayers with the spirit of submission to the greater wisdom of God. When Jesus momentarily, remember what he's saying right here? Ask anything in my name, and the Father will do it in the context of my character and all of that. But here's what we need to understand. In just a matter of minutes, Jesus will be in the Garden of Gethsemane praying. And he will pray, not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. In fact, in one location, in one gospel, it actually says, and he repeated the same words. This is really important. It is not repetition in our prayer that is problematic for God. It is meaningless repetition in our prayer that is problematic to God. 
Jesus repeats this same phrase over and over again. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. If it is possible, can we find another way? The reason I love Mark 14, 36 is in Mark 14, 36, Jesus says, Abba, Father. Abba is the term of endearment. It means I know you love me. There's the love side, right? My Father loves me, Jesus would say. All things are possible for you. That's the powerful side. God can do all things. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. On the wisdom side, Jesus said, I'll submit to you. Father, I'll submit to you. I know you love me. I know you're all powerful. But in the event of your wisdom, whether this is the best way to do it, for me to have my relationship torn with you, for me to go through that, I'll submit to your wisdom. Wow, that's a great way to pray. You and I should, can pray with all confidence, but we should never pray without pausing at the end and saying, Lord, nevertheless I yield. Whatever your will would be is what is best for me. We should pray in a way that is consistent with the character of Christ. We should pray in a way that we have confidence that God will answer. <clears throat> but we should always pray with a spirit of submission that says, I trust your wisdom more than mine. Here's the final idea. You can be confident that Jesus overcame the world even when you struggle daily. You can be confident that Jesus, that, that Jesus overcame the world even when you struggle daily. This is how you have peace in a world of anxiety. You can face an uncertain future with the hope of eternal life. You can be assured that God hears your prayers and answers as his best. But the final one is just as important. You can be confident that Jesus overcame the world even when you and I struggle daily. Look with me at the end of this text, verse 29. Oh, let me back up, verse 25. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day, you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. For the Father, I love this, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. There it is. Remember I said eternal life is available to those of us who believe that Jesus is who he said he was. I came from the Father and I have come into the world and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. Verse 29, his disciples said, ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. And Jesus answered them, do you believe? Okay, now stop for a second. Why, when they said they believed, and he said they believed, is he asking them if they do believe? Because they're about to fail. Look at verse 32. The hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Now pause, listen. In this setting, Jesus had just said to them, listen, I'm going to be persecuted. You're all going to run, Okay. And the disciples had said, no, 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 not me, not me. And Peter said, though all these other guys, I love this, though all these other guys, they deny you, I will not deny you. Okay. And all the other disciples said, who is Peter? Like, why is he saying that? Like, why did we get thrown under the bus? We won't deny you either. And you know what Jesus says? You're all going to be scattered. You're all going to run. It's going to happen. You're all going to go. And that's why he says, are you sure you believe? Because in a few minutes... When Judas comes and 600 soldiers come and they take me, you guys are going to go. But notice what he says. Don't worry, I won't be alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Here's your last idea. Watch it. Self-confidence as a means to impress will bring failure, not success. Self-confidence as a means to impress will bring failure, not success. If you say, hey, I can do this, I can do this, I, I got this, I got this, that's going to bring about failure at some point. Because we don't need self-confidence, that's what the disciples had, and that's why they ran. Okay. We need Christ's confidence. And his forgiveness and power is the means to overcoming. Check this out. Look with me at this little phrase in verse 33. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. Now, if anybody's got a King James, you probably read a rendering there like, be of good cheer, okay? I love this. It actually means cheer up, okay? Like, that's it. It's literal. It's just cheer up. It's not that bad, right? You say, what? It's not that bad? We're about to be chased by soldiers. We are thinking we're going to die. The one we're following is dying. How can you tell me to cheer up? 
Well, I started to look at that phrase a little bit, and I realized that that phrase, take heart or cheer up, occurs in some other passages. Look, in the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. That's the verse we looked at. But look with me at Matthew chapter 9, verse 2. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. Now, the context of this story is there's a paralytic. The man can't walk. That's why he's a paralytic. And he comes to Jesus because his friends bring him. But there is a crowd, a massive crowd. So remember this? The friends go up on the roof with their friend who's a paralytic. They start knocking off the ceiling tiles, and they drop him through the ceiling tile like on ropes. They lower him down. So he's coming right down on top of Jesus. And everybody steps back, and there's the man, okay? Now, Jesus could have said, hey, listen, take up your bed and walk, and he would have got taken up his bed and walk. But instead, Jesus says this, take heart, your sins are forgiven. And remember, all the religious leaders said, hey, who is this? You can't forgive sins. Only God can forgive sins. And Jesus says, okay, take up your bed and walk. And the guy gets up, right? As if to say, I can forgive sins, and I can tell people to get up and walk. And even though they were paralyzed for life, they're going to get up and walk, right? This is amazing. Jesus said, could have said, just take up your bed and walk. But instead, he says, take heart, cheer up, your sins are forgiven. Here's a man who lays on a mat and has laid there all his life. What do you think he thinks when he's on the mat? Does he not at some stage think, what did I do to do this? Oh, yeah, I did that. I had this thought. I sinned this way. I did this. I did this. I did this. What do you think he thinks when people walk by him and scoff and say, hey, you're on a mat? I know what happened to you, right? You probably did some sin of, what did you do to offend God, right? He probably heard all of those thoughts, and he'd said all of those thoughts. And you know what Jesus says? Listen, cheer up. Your sins are forgiven. Wow. When you and I face tribulation, we remember to overcome that we have been forgiven. It's amazing. But that's not the only thing that's amazing. Later in that chapter, in Matthew chapter 9, there is a woman. She's been bleeding. She's had a hemorrhage for as long as she can remember for a long period of time. She comes and she just touches the hem of Christ's garment. And he turns and says, take heart, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. Watch this. For you and I to understand that we can believe that Jesus overcame the world, this is what Christ's confidence looks like, not self-confidence. Christ's confidence says, I'm forgiven, and he has the power to do in me whatever he would wish to do. He is both forgiving and he is powerful. Christ's confidence in his forgiveness and power is the means to overcoming. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I repeat a sin, I'll be on the backside of that sin and I'll say, like, what was I thinking? Okay. I can tell you what I was never thinking. I was never thinking in that moment what it was like to truly be forgiven. I was thinking about the temptation. I was thinking about the pleasure the temptation might bring. I was thinking that it might shorten my difficulty in some way if I only did it this way. And whenever I do it that way, I sit in the back and say, oh, for crying out loud, I did that again. Right. But I was never thinking, Jesus died on a cross to forgive me for my sins because he knows those sins, um, those sins will bring me nothing but pain and suffering. And he died on the cross to forgive me my sins. And in that, he grants me the power to be strong against those sins, not because of who I am, but because Jesus alone had overcome the world. It's a great reminder. Christ's confidence. Jesus overcame the world.